Let's give a warm round of applause to Christina Wall. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll give a little bit of an introduction, um, especially you were asking about how I moved from industrial design to illustration, and I should say I still do some industrial design. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're working on uh, design type projects, there's a lot of NDAs involved and non-disclosure stuff, so you end up not showing as much of that stuff. So uh, the illustration stuff ends up being sort of the star of your portfolio because you know one thing you'll work if you if you work at design firms when you get out of school a lot of times the work that you work on with big corporations they're very you have to sign all the stuff that you're not allowed to show it um, but you know one thing to think about as, as you guys are working on your uh, design and drawing degrees and um, art degrees is that it's really important to be versatile um, you know you want to be able to um, you know, sketching is a really big thing, and so I show a little bit about, um, you know, my process here. Um, you know, sketching is important, um, you know, learning how to render. I know a couple people here have taken my illustration class, and it's important to learn how to make your renderings good. Uh, that's sort of a lifelong process, how you execute your renderings, how you do your artwork. The most important thing is drawing and sketching, and that makes you valuable to a lot of um, different types of design firms and, um, you know, different types of design from doing storyboards to product design, you know, being able to do those initial concept sketches are super important, um, you know, and being able to draw every day, you know, always honing your technique and really being able to think on your feet and draw um, is, is a really important um, facet. Um, do you want me to go a little bit about how I started? Uh, anywhere you want to go, Christina. Okay, because I brought... I, I brought a couple things um, when I when I started when I first graduated from college. Um, I really wanted to do comic books, but I was really slow, and so somebody suggested I should do artwork for role playing games. So um, the first few years that I did artwork, um, I did a lot of work. I did work for about thirteen. Um, let's see, this will be easier. Oh yeah, I did artwork for about thirteen. I didn't do the covers of these, but I did artwork for thirteen Star Wars books. Um, I did artwork for a lot of uh, role-playing games and card games. I, this was for um, Lord of the Rings. This was before the, before the movies came out. So it was kind of exciting to get to do artwork on some stories that I loved that was official, but it wasn't influenced by the movies because they weren't out yet. Did you, did you, you or the other artists you worked with, did any of that work influence the look of the films at all, you think? Um, you know, I, I'm sure that they looked at it. Um, you know, uh, there's been so much Tolkien art done, but I'm sure that they look at all. I probably did, I don't know, 50 or 60 paintings for this over the over the years that I did this game. I did a lot of licensed stuff, like for Dune, Babylon 5, um, you know, Star Wars, um, Battletech, you know, a bunch of different, one, one of the advantages of having gone to school of product design is I learned how to draw product really well and how to draw tech. And so that's, you know, um, one thing to think about if you want to illustrate, when I was talking about that versatility, is, you know, one thing that, especially when you're doing storytelling, is they want you to be able to do, like, a whole scene. You kind of, any, any illustration you do is like a picture of a movie. You kind of, you, you're directing it, like, the point of view, there's a lot going on, you know, in any image, you know, you think setting, lighting, um, you know, cast. Um, you know, and one thing when you're working in children's books or comic books is continuity. You know, making sure the costumes are the same in each page. You know, that the house that you're putting the family in really exists. You know, there's a lot of stuff you have to think about uh, when you're planning your illustrations. But it was fun getting to work on uh, these types of properties. I did work for Dragon Magazine. Um, back in. Unfortunately, it's just, I think, an online version now. Uh, these were some different pieces that I did for that. Um, and uh, we were talking about, I've done some, you know, I've, I've done a lot of toy design and packaging over the years. Uh, these are some um, <clears throat> things that we were doing that were with, uh, I, I did a lot of concepts with Discovery Kids and National Geographic Toys, um, uh, different types of licensed stuff. And, uh, What's the age, age group for these, these toys? Uh, most of these are pretty young, actually. It's like science toys and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and this one, this came out a couple of years ago. This was uh, for a company, a toy company in um, Texas that had the Encyclopedia Britannica license. So I helped develop the product, uh, you know, and also did, a, they did a book with each 
plush that came out. So I did one on chimps, one on lions, and one on elephants. So a lot of times when you're working with companies, if you have a lot of different skills, like you might work with a couple different departments, like you work with, um, you know, in my case, I'd work with the industrial design department and then work with the packaging department or with, you know, you never know which department you'll get to work with, uh, but you can kind of end up getting more work as you, you know, work with different people in the company. Um, these are some package illustrations that I did. Um, this was for like a little doll that came out a couple of years ago and I did all the illustrations for the packaging. What's the, what's the media for these pieces? Uh, these are all vector. Um, this is all Adobe Illustrator. Illustrator. Uh -huh. wow. Yeah. Like I said, versatility is a good thing, you know, because you never know, you know, what your client's going to want. Uh, and so these were the, all their companion animals. Uh, this was one of my favorite uh, art direction. I did this for um, G.I. Joe for Hasbro. And the art director said, uh, I want it to be just like Quentin Tar Tarantino, except without the violence and without the blood. <laughs> How do you judge it? I know. Well, that was, that's the yeah, question. How do you try to keep the humor without the blood. Huh? Yeah, so no, no, yeah, no violence or, or blood. That was a strong. How'd you, so how did you work around it? <laughs> well, he, uh, the, the uh, package designer that I was working with wrote all the copy. And then we just kind of tried to get the vibe of his retro you know, he has kind of a retro vibe with a lot of his movies and stuff like that. So we kind of work from it from that standpoint. Um, but uh, over the years, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of times when you're working for different companies, you know, companies go out of business, in and out of business. And um, I switched my portfolio to mostly children's stuff around the 2000s. Worked at an agency for a little while um, and kind of reshipped my portfolio to get different types of work. I mean, one thing that's important as you guys are building your websites, uh, does anyone have a website here yet with their illustration? Anybody? Or their art? Not yet. Uh, well, one thing to think about when you start making your own website for your artwork is um, make sure that um, make sure that you want to do what you have in your portfolio because what's in your portfolio is what people give you work doing. Um, you know, I've had a lot of you know, if people see something in your portfolio, like if they want a project with tigers, if you have a tiger in their portfolio, they'll use that. If you have, um, you know, a tractor in your portfolio, they'll do that. What about, uh, maybe so you can show us some of your, your uh, work as we're, we're talking in this section. Oh. Um, can you talk a little bit about your portfolio, what you show on your website, what you show art directors, also tone, mm -hmm. edgy versus soft, and how maybe that too is something that is important? You know, I think, I, I, you know, um, obviously, you know, if you're going for certain types of clients, you probably want to have separate areas in your portfolio for, quote, edgier stuff. And, and, you know, if you're wanting to do children's publishing, don't say necessarily direct art directors to your life drawing site. Not that they don't like life drawing, and not that a lot of portfolio, people looking at portfolios don't appreciate that. It's just uh, people hire you on the work that you have. Right. And so you want to, if you want to do children's books or if you want to do comics or if you want to do editorial, that's the work that you have on your portfolio. And one more question. Is, it, is there also a case where you could maybe show too much? Could you be too versatile and not have a niche market? Or is it better to show edgy stuff, softer stuff? Can you do a little bit of everything? I, I think, you know, that, that's the big debate, isn't it? Yeah. People always say, I mean, at this point, you know, one thing that's hard, and I was just actually uh, redoing my portfolio for another portfolio site that I'm trying out, and, you know, when you've done over 40 books, and, and you know, that doesn't include the stuff, you know, that I did in the 90s for role-playing games, you end up with thousands of pieces. Sure. And it's really hard to say, what do I want to show? Which is the best case of doing that? And a lot of times, you kind of tend to air on the more recent pieces, but actually, you know, there's some good older pieces that, you know, should I include? A lot of times when I'm uh, putting together a portfolio, I think about the pieces that, most of the time when people contact me for work, they pick two or three pieces that they really loved, and they say, this is what we want the work to look like. So I don't think, I think if you're too all over the place, they might be concerned, but I think if you have enough work that seems like a body of work, I've never had it. My, I've always noticed people pick pieces that they like. They don't say, well, I didn't like this stuff. Now, I don't tend to have my comic work as much, like I tend to keep that on different sites and 
I have like a, a site for old game work and stuff like that, but I don't, um, most of that is just because there's so much, I don't want right. to put it all together. I remember when I was training as an illustrator in LA, the, the, the discussion was you need to show a niche, a market, you need to be marketable in your area, do the work that you want to do. So if you want to do edge your editorial work, then show that, but it would, would behoove you not to show softer work, advertising work for children, if you wanted to be an edgy editorial person. I was just curious. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it probably depends on the market. I mean, a lot of times, you know, as a full-time artist, you end up doing a little bit of a lot of different things, you know, um, and so sometimes you might be doing, you know, if edgy stuff is what you want to do, you might have a portfolio site for that and then a portfolio site for your commercial work. There's also a fairly robust, um, you know, amount of work doing licensed product, like where I showed the Star Wars and stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of children's books that are put out, like the Little Golden Books puts out a lot of licensed stuff, and people that can take a style guide and draw to any style, uh, can, it can be quite lucrative. It may not be as, um, you may not have as much of a, you know, individual star for yourself is, is saying that it's, you know, as far as content, but there is a, a pretty lucrative track if you're good at that. Mm -hmm. How do you elaborate with your clients? Like, do they find you? Do you network at conventions or? Uh, a little bit of everything. I mean, sometimes it's word of mouth. Probably most of my work is, is found, uh, people find my work online. Uh, you know, I have uh, my work on a couple different portfolio sites. I have a website. Uh, most people find my work on iSpot or childrensillustrators.com. I just put my work on hire an illustrator to try it out. Uh, you know, it's, there's also a lot of free sites. There's Coraflot. There's um, there's Carbon Made. Um, there's I was just looking up some different sites. Behance, of course, uh, which if you have uh, the uh, Creative Cloud that you can get a free site through. Um, and Behance actually seems like it's a pretty nice uh, place to put artwork. I mean, you want art directors to be able to find you, you know, a lot of times when you're mailing out postcards or mailing out mailers, uh, the difficulty with that, not that I'm saying don't do it, the difficulty is a lot of times art directors are looking for very specific art for very specific projects. So they might like your work, but if they don't have a project for it, it's hard for them to do a lot with it. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't contact people, but it means you should have your work available so people can see it. Um, what's your question? So, why is there is a most important for the creating a vector file until, or rather using the photographic things in the artwork? Oh, what's the difference? So, like, what is the unique uh, selling proposition for the uh, creating a vector file towards the end consumers? Uh, well, vector files can be scaled infinitely. You can make them huge. Um, you know, obviously with Photoshop, you have to make sure that you have high enough resolution of your work so that it can be reproduced in print. Um, and now on the web, you know, things are increasingly high resolution too. Um, vector, you can just scale it. But, larger, like if I was going to do a printout as big as the wall, in vector, yeah, it wouldn't degrade, it would get, it would keep. But my question is like, why people don't want to, like right now is a graphic era, people want a graphic more, like mm -hmm. more graphical and sharp things, mm -hmm. uh, really important for the people who want like a packaging or something on the products. So what is a unique selling proposition, like why people choose the uh, sketching things in the vector file rather using uh, actual taking photographs. Oh, you mean why would people pick illustration over photos? Um, well, you know, I think uh, a lot of times illustration is a more idealized way to show things. Like when I paint animals, which I've, I've done, as you see, a, a lot of animal books and stuff like that, photos are not, I mean, you know, there's a little bit of um, I, I try not to make my stuff too photographic. I want it to have sort of an artsy quality, and I don't want it to be super realistic. It's slightly, it's realistic, but it's an idealized realistic. Um, you know, photos, um, you know, obviously, because of their limitations, may not show detail in the way that um, an illustration could. And also, illustration is a nice way to communicate, especially um, you know, if you're doing instruction sheets or if you're doing, if you're trying to show, you know, a lot of stuff. And I don't know if I have, um, 
uh, a lot of these are these are some of my different projects I've done for um, you know a lot of times and I, and I use a lot of you know like when I do books you know I do a lot of photo reference this is kind of time right about one of our students I think a couple of our students right Tia you had a question on that uh, I just wanted to know like you have a lot of exotic animals like if you can't be near them in life like how do you do you like watch you know what I try to do is um, try to find as many photos as, uh, as possible if I can find a top side and front view a lot of times when you're illustrating these books you want to make sure they have the right amount of toes you want to make sure that they have the right kind of teeth um, you know uh, taxidermy sites are great you know because you can find a lot of animals like top front and side especially birds if you're trying to find I've done a lot of bird books and, and finding like when you do an illustration and getting that you know uh, when their wings are in different positions than you usually see you want to make sure that the you know wings are the right colors and stuff so that's a good place to see like a lot of those sites and, and, and um, university like Cornell has a pretty big bird um, uh, database that you can like is on Facebook and on their website and you can and they have like I know it's kind of grisly like wings that they've taken off birds and stuff and you can look at those for color identification um, you know I try to you know you try to learn enough about anatomy for these to draw them in poses that you want them to be in uh, and then um, you know make sure that the colors are correct and that sort of thing as a children's book illustrator you have a little more leeway with artistic license than say if you're a medical illustrator where um, you know you have to be extremely precise and they actually have former surgeons that do uh, medical illustration and that has to be extremely accurate um, you know most of the stuff I do is sort of more um, artsy and they give you a lot of leeway to kind of articulate your artistic vision um, but a lot of times you know when I have animals to photograph I go to zoos uh, I've done and I think I have pictures here uh, this is one of my friends posing for me. I did a uh, version of Black Beauty, and so I made, you know, I make my friends pose for me for artwork uh, when I have to paint people pretty realistically. I did a book a couple of years ago that was called Little Red Bat, and when the editor called me and she said, I'm going to have you do this book on red bats, I'd never seen one, I'd never heard of them, and I had to do, you know, a book of paintings of them. They were on, there was a couple on every page. Um, and so I went to Fort Wayne, Indiana and met with, these were bat rescuers, and, this, and they had just rescued a red bat, so I took video and photos, and he, uh, this was a little red bat, they're so cute. Uh, but they're super tiny, so it was really hard to find even good photo reference anywhere. And this guy would walk around with bats on his shoulder, he'd have a shirt over the bats, and so he'd lift up his shirt and the little bats were all lined up on his shirt. He had all these bins of bats, he would, you know, give them anti-rabies vaccine and then he would release them once they were healed you know he would when people would call him you know he would come and rescue the bats from people's houses people the red bats are very common in this area but they're not in your house so that's why most, most people don't know about them they hang in leaf litters um, and so these are some of the sketches I did um, and that's what the final looks like um, and so, so like the sketch was the color the color finish what what material was that in what medium? Uh, this is all acrylic, acrylic okay. so a lot of stuff like I'll sometimes I'll paint you know a whole image like I have the the uh, elk here sometimes it, you know I'll paint a whole image like this sometimes I will uh, paint things in pieces and kind of put it all together so if you see uh, this find this spread quickly. It's like the second or third. Christina, what's the advantage of working in acrylic as opposed to gouache or oil or watercolor? For you? Um, well, I, I think acrylic scans really well. Um, you know, that's one thing about illustration is you have to learn to scan your own work. So this is how this fit in the, so you see this is the painting and this is where the. It's very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, so it gets changed a lot digitally. Yeah and the pieces and you know you color correct it sometimes and that's why a lot of times I'll paint things separately so I can manipulate the color crop them uh, move it around uh, a lot of final illustration is a lot like doing graphic design and as, as a matter of fact you're working with a designer usually so there's text that has to be worked in totally oh, and yeah we were talking about that earlier before you came in can you tell us as you're scrolling through a little bit more can you tell us when you talked about, uh, as an illustrator, you have to learn to scan your own work, mm -hmm. and, and what's that like, and does that limit your size, or do you take a JPEG if you're doing something really big? What, 
Could you talk about that too as, you're, as we're looking? Well, um, you know, JPEGs are only really for proofing. Um, you don't want to use those for final print. Usually sending a, a lot of people send TIFFs too. I'm not crazy about TIFFs either. Um, I usually send p layered PSD files according to what they want. Um, you know, it used to be you would mail artwork in and they would, like the Star Wars stuff that we first saw, I used to mail all those pieces in. They would scan them in and send them back. Um, and now what happens is um, you send them scans, you upload them. Um, most people, back when I started, people had a pre-press department, which was where they would take your artwork and scan it in, and someone would very carefully, meticulously make sure that the color matched, which doesn't happen anymore. Um, now what happens is, um, and I've recently talked to a friend that had sent original artwork in, and the scans were so bad that he ended up sending his scans that he'd made. And I always send my scan in artwork, mostly because my stuff ends up at the end as a digital file. So while I have a bunch of painted pieces, I put them all together, you know, in one, um, you know, file. Um, and really, as an illustrator, you probably aren't going to be able to get work if you don't do it, if you don't send it digitally to them. Um, Illustration is not like fine art. It's fine art you put on the, you know, and fine art, not to say fine art doesn't have digital aspects to it, but illustration can be done in any medium. That's why I like it. You were asking why I work in acrylic. I think acrylic scans well. Um, I don't get done fast enough to do oil because you have to let it dry. Um, I do know people that work in oil and there's that aspect. You know, I like something that dries really fast that I can throw on the scanner right after I've painted it. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm putting stuff together, I might need to paint an extra leaf or something like that, throw it on there. Um, and so um, I, I think it just, I like the color and vibrancy of acrylic. I, I like, the, the book I just did was the first one I've done in watercolor. And I like watercolor too. Um, I, I think it's kind of, there are different types of techniques, you know. Acrylic is more additive. I tend to paint in a very washy way which, you know, I tend to use a lot of opaques and mix a lot of whites with uh, a lot of opaque color with opaque. Whereas, you know, watercolor is more translucent. One could argue oil is kind of more translucent because you're glazing it. Um, and I just, I, I kind of, that, the way I work is a little differently than that. Um, everybody has their own preference. Um, you know, a lot of illustrators, I mean, we, we basically are all mixed media artists. I mean, we might use a little colored pencil, we might use a little bit of, you know, whatever, whatever we need to do to make it look the way we want it to look. I mean, sometimes on these, these uh, final spreads, I've used, you know, acrylic, I've used watercolor, I've used ink, I've used color pencil, I've used Illustrator, I've used Photoshop, I've used Manga Studio, you know, like sometimes there's like all this different stuff just to get what I wanted at the end. A lot of it boils down to time. You're trying to get the work done as quickly as possible. And so you kind of do whatever you need to do to get it done in time. <laughs> Deadlines are big too. Does anyone have any more questions? You guys said everybody had a question, so. Uh, what's your question? Oh, um, I was wondering what are some artists and some other like uh, children's graphic illustration artists um, you get inspiration from? That I get inspiration from? Um, there's so many. I mean, there's. I, I think Dan Santat's a great artist. Um, he just won the Caldecott a couple of years ago. Um, that award is the top award for, is it just children's book? Is it for just children's book? books, yeah. Children's book illustration, and primarily just America, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I, th I think he's a great artist to follow. Um, in Cincinnati, um, you know, uh, C.F. Payne, mm -hmm. Lauren Long, mm -hmm. Will Hillenbrand, they're all great local artists that are of uh, renown, um, you know, uh, inter or nationally and internationally. Um, from the past, I mean, I love Beatrix Potter's stuff. Uh, I think currently, uh, you know, Adam Rex is doing some really exciting work. Um, uh, I think his name's John Class, and he's also won, and I don't know if I pronounced his name right, he's also won the Caldecott. He used to work at Pixar. There's a lot of overlap between animators and artists um, of children's books. Um, let's see who else am I following? Um, One of my favorites in particular was, I forget his name, you, you might jog my memory, works primarily in graphite. He, he's one of a few Caldecott. Oh, uh, Sean Tan. Uh, or 
That's now, I don't name. know if he's one of Caldecott, but he's he one did, of He did, I think, the Jumanji. Oh, the, yes, the, he was uh, in Cincinnati recently, and I can't yeah. remember his name. Chris uh, Van Van Alls, is it Van Alls? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was recently in Cincinnati, and he does really. I was I was saying, Sean Tan has done, like, con like wordless. Oh, and David Wiesner is one of my favorites. Uh, you know, it's like, as you do. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of artists around, I mean. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time, actually. Um, and as far as uh, comics, I love Jillian Tamaki's stuff. Uh, Hope Larson's really good. Um, Carol Tyler, who's in town, who just won a gold award from the Society of Illustrators, I think, last year for her graphic novel series. Um, as we're looking, can we see your uh, com your comps for your book that you have on there? Oh, okay, yeah. Let me uh, scroll that down. This actually, what, what I have coming through here is I did a biography a few years ago and I had to do a ton of research on that. Uh, this is for Annie Jump Cannon, um, who, when you're doing a book on a real person, you have to do a lot of researchers. This is my only book that's in Harvard's library because I had to talk to the Harvard librarian about um, Annie Jump Cannon work out of the library and I had to find out color choices because you're having to do something that's, that's mostly in black and white. I had people model, you know, based on famous scenes you know, for my illustrations. Um, and this is some of the, uh, this was the cover of the book. Uh, and this is a famous scene, and then how I ended up illustrating it. This was the sketch. Because um, she worked, at, they had all the women in, in, in the Harvard lab crunching numbers. They weren't allowed at the time to go into the room with the telescope and stuff, and use any of the photography equipment. But uh, Annie Jo Cannon was a great suffragette, you know, suffragette and she, was uh, you know the first woman to ever get a honorary uh, degree in science from Oxford University. So I actually talked to them too because I was asking the colors of all the ropes. You know when people when you're working with writers, you know they're thinking about facts and stuff. They aren't thinking about what color is this, and Aesthetic what color outfit. Right and you yeah. know I'm trying to figure out yeah. without offending. You know this is a real person who has family still alive. You know how to make sure that it's accurate so that they don't say oh well that's not what that looks like. So in the next slide there it looks. This yeah, is the sketch there, I did based on. It looks like you left that negative space open for text. Yeah, right? so text yeah. went here. And actually, I don't have, this is actually before the final. This is the painting, but actually this faded. So in the final file, I had this um, cut off and fades. And there's actually a spot illustration up there. So this oh, wow. is just the background wow. painting. There's a spot illustration, and then the text goes up here. As we're, as we're seeing more, do you, are you in contact with the designers that you're working with? A lot of times, yeah. Um, and a, a good designer can make you look good, and a bad designer can make you look bad. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> and I agree with that. That's, uh, that's for sure, right? Uh, the, the, like the designer for Wildlife of Elk was really good. Um, he went with my crazy ideas to... Um, and this, I, did, I went to Montana and took pictures of elk. This was in Kentucky. I worked with... A, this is for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the U.S. Forest Service. So, would your client help you pay, help you cover the cost for research? Yes, a lot of times. You know, uh, they may not pay for all of it, but a lot of times they'll pay for. I, I think there was a question by a student, Sydney. I believe it was you about pricing from early okay. career to where you're at now. Um, I'm, I, I have a, a group of friends uh, where we're very into like the commercial um, illustration and stuff, and we want uh, freelance. So, but um, the biggest question every time someone wants to do like commissions, they're like, "How do I price my art and stuff?" Uh -huh. And I know it's like a big category because it's based on like what you're going in for and um, and what um, how big the project is. Mm -hmm. But like as for someone starting out, well, you know, a good way to uh, think about pricing is, I mean, it used to be the Graphic Arts Guild had prices for like usage. You know, there's a lot of you know, and you, you could get into a big discussion like, are they buying one-time rights? Are they buying uh, work for hire? A lot of times companies buy work for hire, not necessarily to screw artists out of money, but more because they don't want to have to think about it after they've bought it. But uh, you can always have that in your discussion. What are the rights? You know, are they buying one-time rights? Are they buying, you know, rights to reproduce it forever? Uh, you know, you want to take that into consideration with the price. Uh, think about how complicated the art is. Um, different styles take different times to execute. Uh, you know, when you're first starting out, maybe realistically assume how much, how long it's going to take you and, and think about it in an hourly way and, and kind of make a quote based on that. Um, Did you get, when you were early in your career, maybe now you don't have 
as much, you don't need as much help negotiating that. It's kind of kind of a comfortable established career going. But earlier on, did you need some help negotiating that? Did you get advice from other illustrators? Yeah, I think it's good to have community and talk about with other people what they charge, you know, um, you know, and it's important to know, I mean, there's a lot of aspects, not just what to charge, but, you know, how to bill, how to pay taxes, how to keep track of your expenses. I mean, when you're running a business, there's a lot you have to think about and, you know, how are you going to pay for those things. Um, and yeah, it's good to have an artistic community. You know, we have the illustrators in town. We have our weekly illustrators lunch where we meet and we show what we're working on and we talk about. It's a good way to get critiques from other people when you're working on books and that sort of thing. Um, you know, you want to always have feedback from other people. You know, I have a couple artist friends that when I get really stuck, I mean, you never get past the point where you can not need a critique anymore. I mean, sometimes things just aren't working out and sometimes it's really good to have trusted friends that you can have another pair of eyes looking at something and telling you, you know, what you can do to make it, you know, look better than it does. You know, you always, everybody always gets stuck. Every project is so different. You know, you, you know, a lot of times it is nice to have a sounding board on stuff. Um, this project, uh, I, I talked the art director into letting me do a bunch of different art styles. We did some pages that were like comics. And uh, I made this project harder on the art director because he had to make every spread different. Mm -hmm. uh, from their end, you know, when you, does anyone here use InDesign? A couple people, you know. When you're setting up a project in InDesign, you know, it's easiest if you can just set the page style and then just plop the artwork in. But I made him have to change everything each. But he was, you know, he was excited and up for it and he did magazine layout most of the time, so he was up. And this, and this was a project where I didn't give it in full spreads. Like a lot of times the artwork is in full spreads. I gave him spots and he placed them into the layout. So this was done differently than, you know, a lot of projects that I work on where I give them a completed spread and then they put the type in. And okay. some of that was done, looks like in graphite and others were full yeah, color it was, acrylic. It was looking a little bit too stodgy doing it all um, just as paintings. And so I really wanted to break it up with some different styles. Yeah, I think that helps. It's nice. Yeah, it, it was funny because the art director suggested doing cartoon elk, which I thought was, which I wasn't crazy about the idea at first. There's like these little cartoon elk at the beginning of each chapter. Um, yeah, you can see the, it's probably hard to see. They're very tiny. Uh, and I thought that, I, I thought it was a crazy idea, but everybody, whenever they see the book, is like, I love the cartoon elk. <laughs> So, you know, a lot of times when you're working, a lot of times when you're working on a book, they let you fulfill pretty much your artistic vision, but, you know, you do have people saying, well, what if we do this, and what if we do this? So it's kind of a team project. Um, this was for a six book series called um, Sensing Their Prey. So each book was about a different animal sense. So um, this was uh, for Smelling Their Prey. Um, but these are some different, and so here you see mixing a little illustrator with, um, this, this, actually, this painting was done whole. I, I, I might have done the frog separately. I think the snake, so there was the ba background painting with the snake, and I painted the frog separately and then put Illustrator over it. And this is where we're talking about kind of like almost like a science sort of thing where you're showing how, um, you know, this is showing how he could sense the frog from uh, the, the ground, um, you know, kind of like the, the ground moving. Um, and then this is showing the little legs, um, cilia that's on the, the fly. Would you be responsible for the diagrammatic black and white arrow part? or would the Yeah, I did all of it. Yeah. But a lot of times what I do when I give it to a client is I have it um, layered. So mm -hmm. if they decide, if the graphic designer decided they didn't want the arrow there, if they needed to change colors. They could take the layer off. Yeah, yeah. so I, yeah. I make it so that they can, you know, do the, you know, uh, change things if they need to. Um, especially if there's graphic elements. Um, this I had some of the paintings downstairs in the show. I don't know if people, and so I had shown how this one went together. You saw all the paintings. There's like six paintings that went into this one. And these are some of the other ones that are in that book. But they had to use these animals to put on maps and then they have them in this uh, table of contents and they use them in other places. So you have to talk to them about how they're gonna use the art. Right, so one student had a great observation about a lot of your work. Uh, Tia, what was the what were the uh, words you were using? Educational and yeah, it's kind of like educational and topical, 
like, yeah. you're getting like quintessential polar bear right there. Like, yeah, yeah. So well, that's where I talk about the idealism a lot of times in this, as opposed to like, uh, you know, something in a photograph. Yeah. yeah. So do you feel like, um, do you feel like that's, like, in order for children to understand what you're doing, do you feel like that's the best way to communicate with them? Well, it's interesting because um, I was talking to, uh, I'm friends with people that do bird watching, and um, there's a lot of, like, National Geographic has some really good bird books out, and bird watchers actually prefer illustrated bird books to photos because the color variance is so big on, on the real species. Like when they see the drawings of them and the paintings, because of its sort of idealized nature, it's easier for them to identify than using um, actual photos of you know birds in the books. Right. Not to say that there aren't, but a lot of bird watchers prefer the drawings to the um, photographs. Because photographs, a lot of times, uh, and, and this is one thing when you're using photo reference to think about is, is don't, you don't want to follow your photo reference too religiously because a lot of times photographs distort, distort things and you can't totally tell, for example, how many toes are on a foot or, you know, a lot of times photographs distort things in sort of a way. So don't draw something from a photo reference that looks wrong, you know, because a lot of times the distortion makes it look kind of weird, you know, and, and you copy that distortion, then it's a weird looking drawing or a weird looking painting. That's one reason, you know, drawing from life is so nice when you can do it. Um, and actually, our illustrators group, if anyone wants to join it, illustrators, uh, since I have illustrators and lunchers, because we have a lunch every week, a lot of, we go to the zoo a lot and sketch. Uh, we go probably every couple months and sketch. Um, from life, and it's really fun just observing them and drawing from them. Um, let's see, this was from the uh, uh, Big Cats book. Uh, I got to kind of use my industrial design chops, kind of figuring out what um, you know the, the pop up would look at like, and a paper engineer figured it out and sent me back. This is the dye you had to paint to, so this is what the painting had to match. So as you're going through <laughs> these and you, and you say industrial design chops, can you explain for for us what what, what is, we think about industrial design and when you studied, what, what did that look like and what, what was that like and then how is this, how was that preparatory for your illustration career, if it was? It was very preparatory. Uh, does anyone here know what industrial design is? A couple people? Okay. You know. Uh, industrial design is kind of like graphic design except it's 3D. So any product you see, any car you see, that's designed by an industrial designer. Um, you know, uh, anything that's in 3D. Do you um, have Do you have to have engineering requirements to that, or is um, it more some school? schools have it? UC doesn't. Um, it was more artistic, but uh, some programs like Auburn and um, you know they they do have an engineering component. Right. Ours, when I was at Art Center. It was we knew it was part of design. I was an illustrator, so we'd see them working on it. Mm -hmm. But they called it product design. So it was always a little mm -hmm. separate from. You know, graphic designer VCD. So it seems like it was the same, right? Yeah, it, and it's 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 very heavy on sketching because you a lot of it's conceptual. So you're doing concept design of what um, something will look like. If you're doing, say, a new knife handle design or something, you do a bunch of different designs. It's almost a mixture of sculpture right. and and uh, and the objects you use every day and making them um, making them easier to use, more ergonomic, um, and Probably from all the sketching skills, you know, I always liked drawing and, and, you know, one thing that you do as an industrial designer is you sketch a lot. I did a lot of presentation sketches, a lot of stuff for, um, you know, a lot of times they do presentation renderings. I used to do stuff in marker, not so much anymore. Now, right, I, right. now, I, now if I have to do something in marker, I just do it in Photoshop. Right. right. Is, most <laughs> of the training, is most of the training still manual like that or is it still, I'm sure they're I'm still, still sketching pencil, but what? that's more because you know that's more me but right, I'm seeing right. a lot of people do stuff like an, um, I, the iPad Pro using right. Procreate and stuff and I've been really impressed by right, the right. sketches I've seen there. You know when I was a student most of them were still doing it in, in, in 
graphite, and a lot of times ballpoint pen or marker pen, and they'd go right to the markers. Mm -hmm. And they were so brilliant at getting different, you know, shades really quick, almost like layering in watercolor. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering nowadays, are they probably still doing some of that and then going right to Photoshop? More, the, yes, yes, but more if they're doing, I mean, there are concept places in town where you do a lot of stuff still in pencil and put a little marker on it. Um, you know, for fancier presentation renderings, I would probably do those in Photoshop so I can change the color. I mean, one thing to think about whenever you're doing these projects is you might have to change things or move things around because, of you know, you see like some of these projects are really text heavy. And so you have to, you know, they have to be able to move stuff around. Um, I'm going to go kind of through these so I can show, like this for the Crocodile book, this is what I usually give after I get a manuscript. And a lot of times the manuscripts are very... Um, stripped down. Um, sometimes they have page designations, sometimes they don't, sometimes that's up to me. Um, yeah, walk us through a, a project from the start, you know, when you get a, a job, right? And then all, all your phases to your, if you would, your ending. Um, yeah, well what they do is they usually give you a manuscript and um, it's usually in Word. Sometimes you get a PDF that has kind of a rough layout. If I don't have a PDF, I'll, I'll kind of roughly put the type in volume uh, in Illustrator and kind of figure out where it's going to fit when I do the sketch because you're going to have to have room for all the type in these. So you have to make sure that um, whatever you illustrate doesn't get in the way. Now I've still had designers put type across heads and stuff like that. There's no control over that. I try to make sure that, but I have no, no say in that. Uh, so this actually I ended up doing all digitally. I've been kind of experimenting doing stuff digitally, it's, it's different. Uh, digital's just a tool, um, you know, it's like using acrylic or, or uh, you know, there's no shortcuts. You still have to do all the work, hand work to, to do. What are your digital tools? Are you using a... Um, I have a Wacom tablet that I draw on. Small um, one or you have... I have, the, I have the small one. Um, yeah. Just is it on right on the tablet, or do you have to go off? Are you no, it's right on. Screen? I have the, the Cintiq. So the I have Cintiq. a Cintiq, and I, a small Cintiq, and then I have it in a two-monitor setup. So I have a big monitor. And then rather than just having one giant Cintiq, right. I have the little Cintiq, and then I have the big monitor. So you have the 13-inch, I would assume? Yeah. And you've got, yeah. What kind of monitor do you have? Um, let's see what kind of, I used to have a... I used to have a Dell, and I can't remember the kind I had now, because my monitor recently went bad. Right, right. What inch, which size is that? Um, it's one of those big, it's probably about 20, this big. 20, 30, 32 maybe, maybe? Something, somewhere around there. 20s and 30s, okay. Yeah, and Just to get that larger scale. Yeah, I like point. to pull stuff up and then I'll have a bunch of palettes on the, and I'll have like reference and palettes on one monitor and then uh -huh. I'm drawing on the other one. Right, right. Uh, That's interesting. But you know, when you look at this, you know, all, all these illustrations you have to, you know, whenever you show an interior of a house, you have to figure out what's in the house, you know, um, I have a friend that does children's books as well, and he talks about all the magazines he looks at, you know, figuring out costumes for the kids, you know, that make it current, you know, what kind of shoes do they wear. Um, this is for, uh, uh, this just came out last year, this was for uh, Boca and Bison. I'm going to scroll down to a more cartoony book. So in a lot of ways, you're kind of using the industrial design chops that you have all the time because you're thinking about like form and function and how something... Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, your perspective chops. I can see, you know, industrial design heavily one and two and three point. How structured mm -hmm. and clear your renderings are, and that really comes from that kind of that kind of background training. Yeah, I mean, figure out ellipses and you know oh, all yeah. the the, yeah. the way to do that sort of thing. This is uh, I'm, I kind of am skipping down to uh, doing something that's more character driven. So you want to do like I usually just do a bunch of rough sketches of the character you know, either in my sketchbook or, you know, something like that. And then, um, you know, I kind of narrow down. Sometimes I talk to the editor, sometimes I don't. Uh, sometimes they send stuff to the author. Um, on this one, I showed kind of some ideas that I was doing for the editor, and then I did some color comps of her. And How quick do you, what's the quick turnaround time on these designs? Um, you know, these don't take that long. I mean, where, where stuff starts really taking a long time when you're illustrating it is when you have backgrounds and, you know, uh, anything with a lot of big plants in it, you know, anything with, that all takes a long time to do. Anything with like a lot of background, you know, doing a little sketch like this might only take like an hour or something. But doing something where you have all the background and stuff, that's where you start really, you know, where you have a lot of pencil mileage. 
So this was uh, for Cash Cat. So this is cover comps that I sent. I don't always send this many, but I like to show, you know, you want to show a lot of different ideas to the client, um, especially for the cover. For the interiors, I don't do as many sketches, I, I, unless there's something that I have an alternative to. I usually start with thumbnails first and then kind of figure it out design-wise. This one had a lot of, and I don't think I brought the fi final book for this. This one had, uh, it was a counting money book, so I kind of made it like a comic, and I have the, all the moving parts of her counting the money and you know talking uh, with the designer about letting me use the word balloons, which that was a challenge because they do all their books in Spanish as well which um, Spanish takes up more volume. But they're not going to reprint the book, they're just going to reprint that plate. So in some ways, your, your book comps are they're like your own storyboard. Yes, to, to yes. To communicate with your clients what this is aesthetically going to look like. Yeah, so this is the whole book. And I like, this is Adobe Bridge. I don't know if anyone uses it. It's a great way to look at all your sketches together. Adobe Bridge? Yeah, it's part, it comes with, does anyone use it? Like you probably designers. wonder, yeah, why do they have Adobe Bridge here? It's great when you're looking, especially if you have just uploaded like 20 files to a client, you can look and see, you know, tell, tell them what all the files are with a little thumbnail. So it's like a storyboard uh, program. Yeah, I yeah. Use that. yeah. I should use that. Yeah. Which, um, you know, Mac and, and Windows don't, like especially PSD files, they don't show a, a, a thumbnail for, but Bridge does. And it's a great way to kind of organize your... Christina, how much at this stage when you, when you deliver comps to the client, how much back and forth in negotiating design, aesthetics, and changes are, are happening? It depends here? on the publisher and what it's being used for um, and how many people are making the final decisions. Like sometimes there's just one or two changes, you know, on some of the more comic, com uh, complex books like the Animal Atlas or you know, uh, the book for the San Diego Zoo, there might be a lot more changes, you know, because you have a lot more people looking at it, like, for example, a project like the San Diego Zoo Centennial book, you have several groups of people looking at it and making comments. You have people from the zoo, you have the publishing team, and then, you know, they all might have comments that you have to integrate into your sketches. And, you know, sometimes, you know, again, having another pair of eyes, you know, sometimes I'll get a comment on a sketch saying, you know, that squirrel didn't look right on the, that was on the turtle. And I'll say, that wasn't a squirrel or a turtle, that was a really bad sketch. And so then I feel like I need to redraw it and explain a little bit more of what was in that picture. Do you, you might have mentioned this before, do you get fellow illustrator artists, uh, when you're working on a project, and it's not their project to have their eyes look at your work and say, hey, what do you think? Um, occasionally, it depends on the time. You know, sometimes I'll, and, and sometimes when I'm just showing it around to them, they'll make comments too. You know, because sometimes when you draw something, you know, maybe it doesn't communicate what you thought it did. And the bottom line of any of this stuff is communication. Communication, right. Um, you know, illustration is sort of a combination of fine arts and design, um, you know, and so it has to communicate something. That's its purpose. Um, and if it doesn't communicate that, you know, usually they'll let you know, this is what the final art. And again, this was kind of a mixture of painting. Um, you know, I decided, I had just done uh, this book all digitally, and I felt like there was something warmer about painting these. Although, that being said, a lot of times, um, you know, I try not to overwork my sketches. A lot of times I print my sketches out. So when I paint this stuff, when I paint this stuff, a lot of, I print it out on Bristol. And then, oh, I painted, <laughs> I, I uh, print it out on Bristol and then paint it. Uh, and so, um, let's see this piece. Uh, so, so those you, do you mo do most of your work when you're painting on Bristol? Yes. Uh, that's, that's not even a board, that's about, what, 400 or 300? Yeah, I can run it through my inkjet printer. So, yeah, and yeah, sometimes yeah. I will actually um, take the sketch and colorize parts of it uh -huh. so that some of the base color is already laid down and then paint over it. Uh, sometimes I'll do some aspects in Adobe Illustrator and then combine them with my sketch and then print it out in color and then paint over it. To paint over that. Yeah. I mean, and so you can run that, what is that poundage, about um, 200 I think this then? Is probably the two ply that comes in two ta ply. tablets. Okay, two hundred because, then. Yeah, and, and you can run pretty thick, I run watercolor paper through my inkjet as wow. well. Wow, wow. So run, the yeah. stuff that was down in the show for the Chow Chung book, I, I colorized line work and then printed it out and then painted over that. How? What's the largest illustration size that you can work with? A Super B, which is like 12 by 19. So 12 by 19 is your limit. 
I can make it longer, like, because it goes through, so I can make it, I, I think, I've done some backgrounds that were like 20-some inches by 13. If an illustrator, and back, back when I was a student working as an illustrator for a while, there were some illustrators that were doing, could be doing pretty large work, but back then you took a, you took a uh, transparency. Remember that? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember those days. I remember transparency. Yeah, yeah, and then that's what you sent to the client, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't what, miss that. Yeah, yeah, and I don't <laughs> think anybody does, right? What, what would somebody do now if they were working like, let's say a, a medium small size of three feet by four feet? Um, you know, uh, you if you don't have a copy set up at home, you know, a lot of artists that prefer to work big. Now, most children's book artists don't tend to work very big right, because right. we have to do so much work. Like, the larger you work, the longer it takes. Um, we haven't talked about the time element of doing this, but um, like that six book series that I showed earlier, um, when they first called me, they wanted that done in six months. And I said, we're going to have to get another artist. There's no way I can paint 90-some paintings in six months. And wow, 90-something? So they gave me a year to do it. We went a little over a year. You know, and that's, oh, you're also doing other project work. So if you can imagine how much artwork that is, that's almost a painting a day. Um, you know, wh when they gave me a year, that's probably a painting every several days. And you have other projects that you're working on, too. So think about that when you're timing things out. Um, you know, a lot of times working on comics, or working on uh, children's books are not necessarily for the faint of heart because that's what I've, been, I've talked a lot about like time saving measures and kind of putting stuff together digitally. Uh, every second counts when you're working on these. So, well, to, to kind of go back to that one question, if you are working larger, would you have to either, number one, get a larger scanner, number two, scan it in sections? Um, I do scan a lot of stuff in sections. So you, um, yeah. Uh, Adobe Photoshop has a great uh, function called Automate, and it will uh, automatically put all the sections together in one file, and it matches it better than you can. Really? So it's pretty so, seamless? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. So um, some illustrator that recently was doing a poster in town told me he was using it. It was perfect, and he loved it. If you work, though, uh, you know, I used to have a large bed scanner that was like 11 by 17, but my little Epson scans the paintings better, so I use it, which is an 8 and a half by 11 bed. But if you work in like four feet by four feet, you probably want to photograph it. Um, and to do that, you want to probably use a good copy stand or you can have Robin's Color Lab do it. Um, again, when this stuff's going to be for print, you want it to be as well photographed as possible. I see a lot of people, like when they post portfolios, when they haven't really had that much experience with pre-press, you know, they, they, they'll have digital phone pictures and stuff like that, which are almost always not very well color corrected, the detail's not good, um, you know, lighting's really important. If you're going to photograph a painting, um, you know, it's really hard to get that lighting even around a four foot by four foot um, uh, picture. Uh, what's your question back there? Uh, you, yeah, you. <laughs> um, what kind of printer and scanner do you use? Um, I use, I have Epson for both. Um, I, I like Epson a lot, but that, you know, doesn't mean it's necessarily the best. Um, I like the way, and my, I have an Epson printer. The Epson printer that I print out my paintings to paint on is actually 15 years old and still working well. So um, I'm pretty amazed. It's been a little workhorse. It prints, you know, up to 12, but it prints up to Super B and, you know, 13 by as long as. So um, it's been pretty amazing to have a piece work that long. <laughs> I have it on a really old computer that, because it still does, it doesn't even, have, I don't even think it has a USB, it's an old parallel port. Wow. Yeah, but we have a new Epson printer that prints really well too. Um, you know, uh, you might want to do some test scans before you buy a scanner, like Staples and Micro Center will actually let you bring stuff in and scan it in and make sure that your paintings, like watercolors are particularly hard to scan. Um, you know, that could be a whole other discussion about if you've worked in illustration, colors that are in gamut, colors that aren't in gamut. Um, a lot of artists used to paint in Luma dyes, which they don't make anymore because I think they scan so badly. So there's so much fluorescent, like if you use paints with fluorescence in them, um, you know, that can be uh, one aspect that's bad about hand painting stuff is that it's harder to get a color match because CMYK, when people are printing stuff, is such a weak, like, the, you know, it's very hard to get, most of the colors you paint with in your painting class have pigments that can't be reproduced. Right. I think it, it maybe, maybe some art schools, maybe at Art Center they're doing this, and RISD, maybe I don't know, or School of Visual Arts, I'm not sure yet, but it almost deserves its own cottage class. It almost deserves its, 
like one class where all artists, especially illustrators, designers, would go through to color correct and talk about and discuss what we're just kind of scratching the surface on is, is color correction, how to get the best image print for digital for reproduction, you know, onward. So as you're, as you're continuing, we want to see some more as you're continuing to, to go. We've got about a little bit less than 10 minutes left. Uh, this is all done digitally, too. This that's is all done digitally. Yeah, this is macaroon on a dessert island. Right. What, what advice would you give our students here than anybody else out on YouTube land or beyond? How to, how to get started? What, what are some of the myths or maybe some of the fogginess of that that can be um, clarified, kind of demystified, if you will, and uh, maybe talk about the patience also of artists getting started? Um, well, I mean, you know, patience is good. <laughs> uh, but, you know, one thing to think about is don't be, um, you know, be working towards a goal. Um, you know, I, I always, when uh, Lauren Long signs other illustrators' books when you go to his signings, he always says, walk towards your dreams. <laughs> walk, walk towards your dreams? Because yeah. there is a process to get where you want to go. Right. Um, you know, I think one thing when you're starting an illustration, be open-minded. Um, don't turn down stuff because you, it's not exactly what you want to do. Um, you know, if the pay's decent, you know, do. I mean, I think some of my first paid work was doing drawings of a sump pump. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you just, you know, you have, you're trying to make a living. So, you know, building up clients is an important thing. Um, I think a lot of times if you want to do illustration, probably the best way to start is probably work at an agency or some sort of company that, like if you work at an agency and you can do design and illustration, um, it's really good to be able to, you end up assigning yourself illustration projects, you are, end up art directing illustration products, or, you know, if you can illustrate stuff for, a lot of times, a lot of stuff in agencies is just sketching. Um, and being good at sketching is a good way to um, communicate ideas. Well, let's stay here for a second. When you say agencies, let's let's talk a little bit about our tri-state area, the Cincinnati, mm -hmm. Northern Kentucky, Indiana area. Um, without you don't have to name the agencies, but how would our students, since that's a little bit outside of my expertise now, how would they approach agencies instead of the who's? Maybe the what would they approach them with? Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about contacts and networking and. You know, success, failure, success, kind of thing. How would you? How would that happen? Well, um, you know, I don't think it hurts to put sketching in. Like, if you, um, you know, final work's good too. Don't be afraid to show process sketches, like I've shown here. Uh, you know, ideas like if you're going to do, say, a brochure, don't be afraid to show sketches of what you thought the photography should look like. Um, that kind of um, conceptual thinking is really important to studios. There's a lot of studios that hire people to sketch live while they figure out designs. Um, you know, being able to sketch fast and think on your feet is really important. And if you have that skill, it's very marketable. Um, you know, uh, I, I would recommend having a mixture of stuff and showing your versatility when you're going to. I mean, a lot of agencies have needs for people to draw. Um, interiors and exteriors, showing exhibit halls, showing uh, palettes of product, being able to draw all those things, you know, being able to um, give a photographer that you're hiring 10 different sketches of how they should do the layout. Um, you know, one thing a lot of uh, um, design firms find out is when they do comps, just pulling photos off the internet. You'd asked about photos earlier. A lot of times that's so misleading that it makes it very difficult to work with the client because they're like, well, why does my photo shoot at the end look different than the comp you put together from what you cobbled together from the internet? Whereas if you show them a rough pencil sketch, they get the idea, oh, there's going to be a steak here and a bottle of sauce here, but they know that's not what it's going to look like, but they know conceptually what it is. And that type of conceptual thinking a lot of times works a lot better for an agency than you know, just doing a comp that's just sort of cobbled together collage from what you found. It's not exactly what you want, but, you know, you can more, you, the sky's more the limit when you're able to sketch things out first. So don't be afraid to show um, that type of process work. I mean, I think a lot of people forget how important process is to everything. You know, whether you're doing a big fine art painting, you know, doing sketches and preparatory stuff and figuring all those things out to, uh, you know, uh, doing a big ad campaign, you know, for, you know, Old Spice or Febreze or something like that. 
you know, you want to um, plan all that stuff and be able to um, communicate your ideas and being good at sketching is a great way to do that. And then lastly, how, how would they go about approaching agencies? Cold, cold, cold calling, walking right in. How does that, how would they handle that a little bit? You know, I, I, it doesn't hurt to, I mean, in town it doesn't hurt to try to email somebody or call and see if they take interns or see if, um, you know, it certainly is, is different than how it used to be when you had to call people when I started out. But um, I remember walking, schlepping around New York City with my portfolio bag, had two bags, mm -hmm. and we'd drop it off at Rolling Stone magazine, mm -hmm. or you'd drop it off at some other, um, you know, uh, place, Sports Illustrated, and you'd get a call back, say, hey, we like your stuff, maybe we'll use it in the future, and sometimes you get a call back. Is it still like that, or is it like approaching there, emails now? Um, you know, there's a bunch of different ways you can approach it. Um, having a really good portfolio online is a good way to get illustration work. Um, you know, so don't be afraid to put your work online um, so it gets seen. I mean, getting your work seen illustration-wise, and a lot of that's a question about a lot of people say, "Am I is my work good enough to be put online yet?" Um, I think I, I I think people worry too much about that and hold back. Um, if your work is not attracting attention, then just by nature you're not going to get the work. But as your work gets better, then people start paying attention to it. But don't use it as a reason not to put, like a lot of people are often terrible judges of their own work, you know. And so you have to get it out there. I mean, the most important thing is just get it out there. Don't be afraid to call people and show your work. And if they make, you know, if everybody's making the same comment, then, you know, obviously address it. If everybody says, well, why do you never show hands? Or why do you never show backgrounds? You know, maybe you should address that in your portfolio. But um, especially for these agencies in town, having a versatile portfolio is really important. Because you never know, a lot of times they're taking on whatever project, you know, and, you know, one day they might be working on, you know, Valvoline, and the next day they might be working on, you know, Kroger, and the next day they might be working on, you know, a PNG project. You just never know. And being able to visualize in a lot of different ways is really important. Well, that's fantastic. Christina, you've been a wealth of information. So, on behalf of the NKU and the School of the Arts here at the NKU and in my class, Advanced Drawing, Art D410, thank you very much for coming in. We certainly appreciate it.